Well, hello, and, and thank you for the opportunity to be with you today, uh, albeit remotely. Uh, I have the, the privilege of presenting data on a, on a long-running study, one you may have been hearing about for some time now. We called it uh, the Valgan Toddler Study. It was a phase two randomized uh, placebo-controlled investigation of six weeks of oral Valgan cyclovir versus placebo in infants uh, and young children who had congenital uh, CMV-associated hearing loss. Uh, I, I'm, I'm uh, privileged to, to represent the, the uh, numerous investigators on this study. I'll have a slide uh, with who they were uh, here in just a moment. To begin though, my disclosures are on this particular slide. I do intend to discuss uh, use of commercial products and services and uh, primarily antiviral therapies. Uh, and I do intend to discuss non-FDA approved uh, uh, antivirals because there are no uh, congenital CMV treatment studies or, or antivirals yet approved by the FDA. I do have a, a relevant financial uh, relationship. I'm the site PI on the Gilead study of remdesivir for, for SARS-CoV-2 uh, in the pediatric population. All monies go directly to my university and not to me. And obviously this is not a, a CMB related um, uh, disclosure, but one that I did wanna make sure that you were aware of. Well, this particular study, the Valgan Toddler Study, uh, took place at a number of sites across the United States and across the United Kingdom. They're marked on these maps. Uh, we had eight study locations in the United States. We had a total of nine study locations uh, in the United Kingdom. And the investigators who were leading each of these sites are listed on this particular slide. Um, so in the UK, you can see the breadth of, uh, of expertise uh, across the, uh, the spectrum of that particular country. And similarly, in the United States, uh, the experts in congenital CMV associated with this. And I'll, I'll say that, you know, this is a rare disease. This is a rare condition. And it's something that, you know, cannot be studied by, by one center alone. There's just not enough patients with uh, congenital CMV infection, much less hearing loss, uh, to be able to accomplish that. And so that this multi-center um, collaborative kind of approach is, is truly the only way to, uh, to, to, to get to a final answer. Well, this is the reason that we conducted this trial. This is a, a summary back from 2006 that looks at all causes of deafness in the United States at birth. That's the pie graph on the left-hand portion of the slide or at four years of age. That's the pie graph on the right-hand portion of the slide. And the portions of the pie that are uh, shaded in this red, this deep red color, are the uh, percentage of deafness in the United States, in this example caused at birth, from congenital CMV infection, either asymptomatic congenital CMV, babies who otherwise don't have any outward manifestations of congenital CMV infection, or symptomatic congenital CMV. And you can see that about 20%, one in five cases, of deafness that's picked up at the time uh, of birth is caused by congenital CMV. The remainder are different genetic mutations or syndromes. There's non-genetic syndromes as well and environmental causes. Now at four years of age, that portion of the pie has actually expanded so that uh, the total uh, percentage of uh, patients with hearing loss at four years of age caused by congenital CMV is fully 25% of all causes of, of, of hearing loss. And the reason for that is that the portion of the asymptomatics that is expanded has increased um, to a greater extent than uh, in the symptomatic patients. Now let's talk a little bit more about that. These are characteristics um, of audiologic sequelae among patients with symptomatic disease uh, that are, you know, at the time of birth and those with asymptomatic infection at the time of birth. About 40%, this number can go up to 60% in other studies of symptomatic babies will have sensory neural hearing loss versus five to 10% of babies with asymptomatic infection. And that hearing loss can be unilateral, it can be bilateral, it can be high frequency, it can be delayed in onset. That's the reason that the portion of the pie graph uh, at four years increased among the asymptomatics. It can be progressive. Uh, get worse over time, it can fluctuate and improve even over time, which is why it's so important to do placebo-controlled studies or at least controlled trials, comparative trials, so you can make sure that any kind of improvement you think you may be seeing 
uh, actually is, is because of the therapeutic intervention and not just by the, the natural history of the disease. Now on the next slide, I wanna, I wanna dig down into the universe of patients that are destined to have sensory neural hearing loss. So the 41% in this example uh, of the symptomatics who do have hearing loss are gonna make up the 100% on the next slide. The 7.4% of babies with asymptomatic infection at birth will make up the 100% on the next slide. And what I'm showing on this particular slide is the progression of the percentage who have sensory neural hearing loss over time. So you can see at birth 45% or so of symptomatic babies um, who are destined to have hearing loss will have it at birth. And then about 25% of asymptomatic babies who are destined to have hearing loss will have it at the time of birth. And this increases such that, you know, at three months of age, it's 30%, at six months of age, it's 45%. These are for the asymptomatics. By two and three years of age, you're just below and just over 50%. And then you're out by six years of age to 87% and then up to 100% because that's the way I've structured the data on this particular slide. And then you see the similar um, percentages for the symptomatic population. Well, we know that we can treat babies with symptomatic congenital CMV disease if therapy is started in the first month of life and have a positive impact on their hearing outcomes. And I'm gonna summarize those data from a couple of different large studies that this group, this collaborative antiviral study group that contributed these, these most recent data in the Valgan toddler study that we had done in earlier trials. And the first was a phase three uh, randomized controlled trial, a treat versus no treat st uh, study design. And specifically it used six weeks of intravenous gancyclovir. And the way this, uh, this slide is laid out is for the gancyclovir recipients on the left, the no treatment group on the right, whether they had either improvement in their hearing, that's the portion of the, of the pie uh, graphs that are in green, or if they started out with normal hearing, they maintain normal hearing, versus those that either started out with abnormal hearing and maintained abnormal hearing, didn't get better in other words, or um, uh, actually worsened. And you can see that among the gancyclovir group getting six weeks of IV gancyclovir started in the first month, uh, uh, month of life, that the likelihood that their ears would worsen or uh, remain abnormal was lower than the likelihood of that happening in the group randomized to no therapy. And this was statistically significant with a, a large odds ratio, but uh, the adjusted uh, uh, odds ratio was 10. Um, the 95% confidence intervals is what I was alluding to was, was pretty broad on that study. But it led us to then look at whether six weeks of antiviral therapy could perhaps be improved upon by treating for six months. This was with oral valgan cyclovir by the time this study was conducted. Same kind of layout, the babies uh, or children getting six weeks of antiviral therapy on the left, getting six months of antiviral therapy on the right. And this is a total ear assessment so that 43% of the shorter term uh, treated uh, ears uh, worsened or remained abnormal versus 27% of the ears in uh, subjects receiving six months of therapy, longer therapy. This was statistically significant with an adjusted odds ratio of three. And that was looking between birth and 12 months of age. This is looking between birth and 24 months of age. That benefit continued 36% um, of ears worsening with shorter therapy, 23% of ears worsening with longer therapy, statistically significant, an adjusted odds ratio of about 2.6. Now in all of those studies, antiviral therapy was started in the first month of life. So the hypothesis with this particular trial was that six weeks of antiviral therapy will stabilize hearing deterioration in persons started, who start on therapy beyond a month of age. So young infants, uh, toddlers, young children with CMV associated hearing loss. Now I'm gonna cut to the chase here because I, I don't want you to be you know, waiting uh, with bated breath for, for the results. This did not work. This was, this was a failed study. And I want us to dig into what the data show us so that we maybe can come out of this with generation of new hypotheses, new ideas, new understandings of what this may mean with respect to why some patients have progression of their hearing loss through those first few years of life. And yet antiviral therapy, at least as captured in this study, 
did not uh, detect a, a benefit. Our sample size calculation is listed on this slide. We plan to enroll 54 subjects who would randomize to therapy and be a valuable uh, at both their baseline hearing, but also their six month hearing assessments. This would give us 90% power to detect the proportion who had worsening of hearing going from 40% in the placebo group down to 8% having worsening of hearing in the treatment group. And I'll say this is a very large treatment effect. Uh, it, it was similar to what we saw in that first um, study of six weeks of antiviral therapy versus no therapy. But we, 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 we made a calculated decision early on that we would be looking for this large treatment effect, you know, if for no other reason, because these are, these are very few and far between subjects. And, uh, and, and we had to have some feasibility assessments as well about time to enrollment. Endpoints are represented on this slide. The primary endpoint was change in total hearing. Each of us have two ears. Therefore, each of us could have potentially two evaluable ears at the time of the study analysis. That's the total ear assessment. Now, not you can't just take the total number enrolled and multiply by two to get the total ears that were evaluable because you know maybe one ear had otitis media or some reason why you could not uh, go on to, um, uh, to, to be able to determine what the particular hearing was in that particular ear. Uh, but, but it does give us a larger sample size, a more robust way to look for these data. In addition, for secondary endpoints, we also looked at uh, change in best ear. And you'll see here that these changes are, are multifaceted, improved versus normal uh, uh, plus normal to normal. In other words, normal hearing to begin with, normal hearing at follow-up versus other, improved versus other, and so forth. I'll, I'll dig into that a little bit deeper when we're actually looking at the data. Same for the remainder of the total ear assessments. We looked at impact on viuria on viremia and on detection of CMV and saliva in multiple fashions as well, both um, qualitatively as well as quantitatively. We looked at a uh, change in viral load uh, versus hearing outcome. We looked at safety issues, unanticipated medically attended visits or adverse events. And we also looked specifically at neutropenia. Our inclusion criteria, of course, required informed consent to be signed. Um, the uh, patients, if they were to enroll and become study subjects, needed to be from one month of age up until their fourth birthday. And they needed to have sensory neural hearing loss as documented within the prior three months to study entry. Now, notice on this slide that I, I, I'm not requiring that they carry a diagnosis of congenital CMV at the time they sign informed consent to enroll on the study. That is required, but before they randomize on the study, I'll tell you a little bit more about that when we talk about study design. Exclusion criteria are, are, are numerous. The most important ones are that if they had profound sensory neural hearing loss in both ears at baseline, they would not, they would not be allowed to enroll. We, we, we um, thought that that was a, a different kind of patient then we would want to test antiviral therapy in, in this controlled trial setting. And the other main one is that they cannot have previously been treated with gancyclovir or with valgancyclovir. So here's the study design. Phase two study, multi-center as you've seen, uh, double blind placebo controlled. Uh, the treatment was six weeks of valgancyclovir therapy, the, the, the dose that we'd studied previously in patients with virologically confirmed congenital CMV infection. I've told you that they're one month up to their uh, uh, fourth birthday in terms, of, uh, in terms of the age of enrollment. Now, these subjects would either, either already have confirmed diagnosis of congenital CMV made within the first 30 days of life, or more likely, and especially at the beginning, we thought this second group was really gonna be the group that enrolled overwhelmingly. They had no idea that they had congenital CMV. They were recognized to have sensory neural hearing loss at say 18 months of age. And so in order to go back in time and be able to determine whether they had congenital CMV in those very early weeks of life before postnatal acquisition would be a, a likelihood or a possibility, we would pull their dried blood spots, their Guthrie cards, 
and do CMV DNA PCR analysis on that. Now we anticipated that more of the subjects would be enrolled in that group, not having a prior uh, diagnosis of congenital CMV. In fact, we, we really did not see that to the same extent that at least I thought we would, but that's the reason that at the inclusion criteria, we did not require them to carry the diagnosis of congenital CMV because many of them would not, and yet the Guthrie card, the dried blood spot, would be what proves that they in fact had congenital CMV infection. They then were randomized once it was virologically confirmed uh, and uh, you know, started on antiviral therapy or on matching placebo. We did stratify uh, for under a year of age versus a year um, uh, through uh, to the second year, uh, two years up to three years and three years up to four years. And we also stratified by symptomatic versus asymptomatic in order to look and see if we could see differences. 54 subjects enrolled of those 35 randomized. So we didn't hit our enrollment criteria uh, from that standpoint. And of those 35, 32 completed both the six week and the six month study visits. Demographics are shown on this slide and the next two slides. You can look and see, and none of these are statistically significantly different. You can see that about half of the subjects in the Valgan uh, randomization arm were under a, a year of age uh, versus about a third in the placebo group, 23 or 24% in the second year of life versus 33%. Uh, and then we had fewer uh, in the, in the um, uh, two to three years of life uh, in the treated group versus placebo and more in the three to four years of life in the treated group versus placebo. But the overall balance here was, was uh, uh, similar across the two randomization arms. This is where I, I was most surprised. You know, anywhere from two thirds to four fifths of these uh, subjects who enrolled were symptomatic at birth. And that, that's different than, than the population I really was anticipating that we would be studying in this particular trial, although it was, you know, it was, it was allowed for it, it, with our inclusion criteria. While there is a numerical difference here with respect to gender, um, the p-value is accurate at 0.73. And then we have um, uh, uh, race and ethnicity, uh, and you see no statistically significant differences there. And we have gestational age at delivery balanced across the two arms uh, and age and enrollment also balanced across the two arms at about a year and a half uh, uh, for the mean uh, and somewhere between a year and a year and a half in terms of median age and enrollment. Now, uh, this is a, a, a breakdown of the degree of CMV involvement uh, at, at either birth, which are these first uh, several rows, or either birth or later. Uh, and again, you see no statistically significant difference uh, with respect to the degree of CMV involvement at those various time points. Our primary endpoint, as I mentioned, was total ear assessment. This is the vow, these are, it's hearing at, or, uh, at baseline and at six month total ear hearing. Uh, the Valgan cyclovir group shaded in this kind of a yellowish color, the placebo group shaded in green for each of those two time points, normal hearing baseline in six months, mild hearing baseline in six months, moderate, severe, not a valuable withdrawn. And just take a moment and, and look at the balance across this. Uh, in terms of um, these numbers. They, they look you know, pretty suspiciously even in terms of that. And then if we start collapsing these down into the categories, um, these categories are, are represented on, the, on this slide and, and several subsequent slides. Again, this is change in total hearing, improved, none in the get Valgan group, none in the placebo group, no change, six in the Valgan group, nine in the placebo group, and that's no change normal to normal. They started out with normal hearing. Starting out with abnormal hearing and not changing, 14 and 18. And if anything worsened um, numerically, uh, more of in the treated group worsened compared with the placebo group. And if you start collapsing these into different groupings, improved or no change, either because they started out normal and stayed normal, or they started out abnormal and they stayed abnormal, same degree of abnormality, versus worsening, 
no uh, statistically significant um, uh, p-value. This is the one that's going to get closest to statistical significance, and it actually uh, favors placebo over valgancyclovir. I'm not sure I'd make that comment as a conclusion, but it, it's certainly not trending in the right direction from the standpoint of this being a therapeutically beneficial approach. And if we then look at other groupings, we have improved versus no change normal to normal or abnormal to abnormal or worsened. That's not uh, there are no p-value there at all because there were none that were improved. Improved or no change, normal to normal, normal at baseline, normal at six months, uh, p-value 0.48. And then we do the same sort of thing for best ear analyses. This is where our sample size is less, um, but, uh, but we're looking at the total number of subjects uh, at baseline and total number of subjects uh, and their hearing, um, uh, best ear hearing uh, at follow-up. And again, just kind of take a moment and look across these rows and you see really very balanced numbers um, uh, on this particular uh, layout. And if we start collapsing these down, improved, no change normal to normal, no change abnormal to abnormal, worsened, um, the, the numbers are, are pretty similar and we're gonna start grouping them here improved, normal at baseline, normal at follow-up, abnormal at baseline, same degree of abnormality at follow-up versus worsened, p-value 0.08, but the worsening occurred only in those who were getting active drug. Improved versus the others, improved plus normal uh, to normal at baseline in six months, p-value 0.71. Now we did some post hoc analysis for the asymptomatics at birth and the symptomatics at birth. And, and again, just you know, looking across these, there really is nothing that is jumping out as um, suggesting that uh, really there was a difference here. The numbers get very small though, so we're reluctant to do much in terms of statistical analysis here. And we also did a similar post hoc analysis for those that were um, enrolled at uh, under a year of age versus one year up to their fourth birthday. And similarly, you know, if anything, it's the, the group getting Valgan uh, in the under one year of age that, um, that actually had the worsening. Viral load data represented in the blood, in the saliva, in the urine, active, that's Valgan cyclovir in blue, placebo in red. Uh, the hash mark is difference between baseline from the baseline and the, and the stars or, or asterisks or difference between active groups. So you can see that in the uh, saliva, there was a decrease from baseline in the active treated group. You would expect that. Same you saw with respect to the urine. And there was a difference with, um, with, uh, between the group who was randomized to placebo versus active in the amount of virus in the urine. And then if you do box plots, uh, looking at the baseline viral load in blood and saliva in urine versus normal to normal hearing or no change abnormal plus worsening of hearing, perhaps there was a, in the urine anyway, a somewhat lower viral load um, if the person had normal hearing and maintained normal hearing in the total ear assessment, but there's a lot of overlap here as well. Now, fortunately, we did not see the kind of neutropenia concerns that we were suspicious that we might. Again, active is in blue, placebo is in red, and, and this is the, the mean um, absolute neutropil count. So you want to be higher in this particular uh, graph. And in fact, the patients getting active drug were higher, uh, with, and, and, and we really did not see problems with respect to neutropenia with this six weeks of therapy with oral valgan cyclovir. There were three neutropenia cases that were considered to be related AEs. That was uh, per protocol. We said that we would um, consider them to be related. And then there were, uh, that was in the Valgan group, and we had eight related AEs in the placebo group, uh, cyto um, cytopenias, uh, agitation, and skin discoloration. There were no grade three or grade four events. So our conclusion is that in this randomized double-blind placebo control trial, Initiation of antiviral therapy beyond the first month of life to children with congenitally CMV-associated sensory neural hearing loss did not improve or stabilize hearing outcomes. It did decrease the amount of virus in saliva and urine, but there was no real clinical uh, correlate. And Valgan cyclovir was well tolerated in, in this population. So I just want to finish with a, a speculation of possible reasons. And you guys 
during our, our, our conclusion here, hopefully we can have more conversation about this as well. Um, but but it, it, there's a number of things. The treatment effect could have been smaller than what our sample size could have seen. That's a definite possibility. We don't see patterns that would suggest this, but it is possible. Could be that sensory neural hearing loss um, is caused by viral replication in the inner ear, but gancyclovir, which is the active drug of of the prodrug valgan cyclovir doesn't cross this, what I call the blood inner ear barrier when you get beyond the neonatal period. Maybe that barrier tightens up as a child gets older. Sensor neural hearing loss is caused by viral replication in the inner ear, but we didn't treat long enough. That's a possibility. It's possible that sensor neural hearing loss is caused by replication in the inner ear, but the benefits of therapy occurred earlier than six months of treatment of a follow-up or later than the six-month follow-up time period. We might not have hit it right. It's possible, though, that it's immunologically mediated when you get beyond the neonatal period, and that immunologic response induces an inflammatory kind of uh, inner ear process, and that's why the antiviral therapy didn't work. And finally, it's possible that our population simply was too heterogeneous to see the effect. You know, we had too many that were symptomatic at birth versus, uh, versus asymptomatic. There might have been differences in the way U.S. subjects versus U.K. subjects were recruited into the study and so forth. So I'm going to end there. I appreciate your time and your attention. I'm sorry we didn't deliver to you a, a, a positive study, but I think we can learn a lot from this negative study, and I appreciate your time.